Um, okay, so now we have the, the ECR um, report back after their uh, whatever night that was, Tuesday night get together. Um, so we have 15 minutes for this and, um, and then we'll get to the science talks. Well, hi, everyone. Um, so we are reporting back on Tuesday night's ECR activity. Um, really grateful for everybody that came out to that. I think it was, it was a good time to just sort of bond, chat, discuss, uh, answer some fun questions. contributed to what we're about to s talk about in this slide, so I just want to acknowledge that we're representing the voices of everybody, not just the three of us. Um, so the first question that we asked was, what do supportive communities look like to you? So this fun little word cloud, um, it's not based on how frequently things were said, because everything was just said once, but uh, it is just a fun little representation of what we kind of came up with. So things like checking in on each other, making connections, people who listen, uh, not clicky, flexible, inclusive, uh, no blame, no shame, things like that are what we find to be an inclusive community just in the broader terms. But then we wanted to sort of focus that in into what that meant for the waste community specifically. So we hung up these post-its around the room and had everyone based on their career level sort of stick up a post-it. I remember what colors you were. So green was undergrad, purple was masters, PhD was yellow, blue, postdocs, pink, faculty, and then orange were professional researchers. Um, so we had everyone sort of in mix of career stages grouped together and rotate around the room, and you had five minutes to discuss as a group or individually put up some post-it notes on what these questions meant to you, what answers you had, um, and I think that allowed for some, some good conversations as well as some, some bonding. Um, and then we also included for our first question, what do we like? So we wanted to be, you know, start on the positive note, <laughs> uh, provide some, some positive reinforcement and feedback for the organizers and those that are attending here. Um, and I think there was a lot of, of positive things to say. So ease of networking and starting conversations, um, accessible travel funding opportunities, intimate setting for people staying on site, having meals together, interdisciplinary science, lots of ECRs, um, but I would also say we have lots of mid to late career as well, which is really important for us trying to network. Um, focused meeting um, about the most relevant science in the field, and I would also say a meeting that is starting to broaden a bit outside of waste as well, which is super encouraging, um, and then hearing from funding agencies, which has been super helpful, I think, for those of us that really don't have that face-to-face -face interaction or don't even know where our funding comes from. Um, so for career development, we started with what we do have and what we maybe don't have yet. Um, so currently, there's tons of opportunities for networking and um, receiving informal mentorship. So all, all of these conversations that are happening during breaks and during lunch and dinner, that's opportunities for you to, to network with people that could help you with your research. Um, and then receiving constructive feedback with these uh, student forms that are able to, to fill out and, and give feedback on. Um, and then these training workshops on Thursday, people are seem to be really excited about. Uh, but the gaps that exist, I think having a system to really share more opportunities for how to apply to grad school or postdoc slash faculty positions, um, how do you get a job, things that, you know, the questions that I think a lot of students have that maybe they don't know how to answer or find resource resources for on their own. Um, create waste community job announcements. So it was mentioned that there is cryo list, but cryolist can be very intimidating. I don't know if you all get intimidated or <laughs> overwhelmed by their emails, but if there was a way to maybe focus that in so that we could sort of create a waste-specific board for that, that would be helpful. Um, formal mentoring programs. So we have had mentoring programs in the past, and that was talked about a lot in bringing that back. I think that would be another great way to sort of connect the community from an ECR to mid to late later career stages. Um, as well as sort of provide that postdoc mentor 
undergrad, PhD sort of network. Um, affinity groups, so having groups for future current parents or you know groups for um, minority groups or anything that maybe feels like you want your own specific or specified group of support. Um, Non-academic career advisement, so we talk a lot about academia in this room, but not everyone wants to continue in academia, so I think having options outside of that world would be hel helpful. Um, and then leadership opportunities and a f whole range of workshops, which are in our other slides as well. <laughs> but a lot of people are, are excited and would love to talk about things that we could probably construct into smaller workshops, so just keeping all of that in mind. So in terms of technology support, we asked ECRs um, what kind of gaps exist in terms of technology. Um, so some things that we'd like to see is a general glossary of technical terms. Um, people were also wondering about high access to high performance computing resources. Um, and a lot of questions were also about fieldwork resources. So in terms of gear sharing, packing list recommendations, um, so that when you go out in the field, you're prepared. More workshops. Um, a lot of people were interested in workshops on instrumentation, so learning more about using radar and seismic data. Um, people were also inter interested in um, improving their coding skills and learning best practices when it came to coding. Um, machine learning was also a big one. Another um, one was also geophysical processing, and we do have a lot of hackathons, um, particularly with ISAT2 in the crowd community, and so maybe kind of bookending those with um, booking and having those being a part of waste could be a good thing as well. The last thing was also technology grants, if there was any sort of funding that could um, be supplemented for that. Okay, so uh, the number one sticky that came up under the networking category is that the ECRs love that they can make friends here. Uh, which I think reflects uh, really well on the spirit of the Waste Workshop. Um, ECRs also really like that it's accessible to interact with the funders, not just hear from them in presentations, but talk to them as well. Um, ECRs also really enjoyed the opportunities to form collaborations and, and connections um, with other folks in the room. Um, and I guess we have interact with funders on here twice, so hopefully that just <laughs> reflects how great that was. <laughs> um, one thing that was um, mentioned was that it might be nice to have um, some more organized networking activities at the start of the waste meeting. Um, the ECR activity was at the end of you know the first full day, and it might be nice to get to know people earlier on if possible. Um, one thing that was also called for a lot was sharing more information about some of the various cryo groups and organizations that are, you know, created to support uh, people in this field. Uh, so sometimes that access to information is limited to the people who present on those opportunities here and are really adamant about sharing those, but having a more widespread way to share those or more consistent might be really helpful. Um, ECRs also were hoping for the president, the presence of more mid and senior career folks, uh, which you've already mentioned. Um, and then there was also a call for maybe some more waste community events or networking events at larger meetings. So kind of bringing back some of the folks that are here at other conferences as well. Um, also access to meetings for non-US um, participants and more support for non-native English speakers. Okay, and then finally, based on all of those um, points, uh, we also at the end of this session made a list of, of actually actionable items that we were hoping that could be implemented a little bit more easily uh, in response to the, some of the conversations that we had. Um, so going back to this idea of sharing information about cryo groups, um, we were really hoping that there could be more presentations about these groups or maybe like a list of all the groups compiled somewhere so that that information is accessible to um, people in the community and people at the workshop. Um, an example of that is that not everyone knew that they could sign up for the Paseco Slack and the newsletter at paseco.org. 
Um, and that there could also be some regional emails for meetups. Um, so not just gathering like once a year and a lot of people flying across the country, but people in other various parts of the US being able to meet up intermittently as well. Um, going back to our like having a glossary of terms, people <laughs> were also hoping that we could maybe use slightly fewer acronyms um, in some cases or, or try to be good about defining some of those before they're used um, in context. There are a lot of us coming from different fields and a lot of us who don't know about like funding situations um, also experience a lot of acronyms used in those contexts as well. Um, there was also a call for potentially having introductory slides from people who are not giving talks and are not presenting posters as a way to still be able to like share themselves with the group and just introduce themselves and who they are to the community. Uh, we're also proposing like a cross-career stage icebreaker activity. So um, this maybe goes with that more formalized mentoring program and some of the calls to bring that back. But the idea being that we had this really fun ECR activity, but we also do like interacting with mid and senior career level folks and would love to have more of those opportunities to engage. And then finally, one very actionable suggestion was also to include ca closed captioning for slideshows, which is uh, very implementable over PowerPoint and Zoom. So, yeah. Sweet, so thank you all for giving us this time to talk to you about what the ECR has talked about together. Um, we we ha couldn't have done this without the help from Mariama from Paseco, so make sure if you are an early career and you wanna get involved with Paseco that you do so. You can use this uh, little QR code to, to join or just check out the website. Um, but yeah, I don't know, hopefully we have some time for questions. Um, but if you and if you're an ECR and you feel propelled to answer any of the questions that come up, please do so as well. So thank you. There is time if anybody has questions or comments or any response. You're not. Oh, Matt's coming to the mic. I have a comment. It is not a question. Um, but the idea of regional th um, events, I think, is very important because that's when you can get even earlier career people involved. We have, you know, four undergraduates in here, but we probably have a hundred undergraduate researchers in our groups. Um, they do exist. Uh, some of them are out there. There's uh, Northwest Glaciology has been going on for however many years, and it's even more informal than this. Uh, there's the Colorado, <coughs> Colorado Glaciology Group, there's Midwest Glaciology, there's Northeast Glaciology that comes and goes. I don't know the current status. Uh, but if you are interested in these regional groups, there's a Bay Area Glaciology once upon a time. Um, I think these things are really fun. If you don't have one of these in the region of your world, start one. They're very easy to do. It's like graduate students can do the whole thing and can plan the whole thing in an hour, basically, right? You just throw out an email and reserve a room. Um, so I highly recommend those and starting them if you don't have one or getting in touch with me for the Colorado one or um, Lee Stearns for Midwest Glaciology. Who runs Northwest Glaciology? Is there like a contact to get on the email list though? Well, we should work on that. <laughs> TJ Fudge, email yeah, TJ, TJ Fudge. Email TJ. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you guys. And uh, yeah, that we really appreciate putting in the effort of having those conversations and giving the feedback here. Um, we will take that all into consideration. I did just see on CryoList an assistant professor job was just listed at Syracuse University in polar science and, and cryosphere. So there's a little waste workshop delivery for you. Um, ask us <laughs> if you're <laughs> interested in applying for that. Um, but let's get on to the next session, so next we have end glacial and subglacial advances. So if the conveners come up and the first speaker is Tyler. Oh, look at that going. Oh, sh <laughs> jump the gun. <laughs> Hi, 
Hi, uh, I'm Atsu Muto. I'm an associate professor at Temple University. I'm one of the co-conveners along with. Hi, I'm Zachary. I'm a graduate student at the Colorado School of Mines. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm a postdoc at Georgia Tech. Like just Peter said, we have Tyler Perry uh, talking about the subglacial discharge from our subglacial basin. Hi everyone, um, thanks so much for being here early morning. Um, so my name is Tyler Pelly. I'm a postdoc at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking about some um, Antarctic ice sheet coupled modeling work that we've been working on for the Aurora Subglacial Basin in East Antarctica. I'd like to thank my collaborators, which are um, listed right below my name, and then um, also for the conveners for organizing the session. So um, subglacial freshwater has been inferred by both numerical modeling and observational studies to be widespread across the Antarctic. Subglacial freshwater actually is. And so we're showing the subglacial water flux in units of meters squared per year. Um, and you can see that there's um, pretty condensed channels of subglacial water flowing beneath pretty much every, um, every dynamic outlet glacier along the eastern Arctic coast. I've also added some, some of these um, dots. So I have one in the Amundsen Bay and then also along the eastern Arctic coast there, and that's just highlighting where um, warm water has been inferred to flow on the continental shelf and rapidly melt um, the glaciers in those regions. And so zooming in on the eastern Arctic coast, um, the region I highlighted is a large section of the Aurora subglacial basin. And so this is a deep glaciated basin in East Antarctica. It contains about seven meters of sea level rise equivalent ice mass, and about 80% of the ice is grounded below sea level. And so using another water routing model, um, Wright et al. in 2012 showed that there's pretty strong subglacial channels that drain hundreds of kilometers from the interior of the ice sheet, and it carries fresh water um, across the grounding lines and into the sub-ice shelf cavities of almost um, every glacier in this basin. Um, so namely, we have Totten Glacier, um, which is on the bottom there, Vanderford in the middle, and then Denman up, the, up top there. And so even though we know that there's subglacial freshwater um, in most places along the Antarctic ice sheet, we really don't have a good idea of how this could drive ice dynamics on projection timescales, because these um, like forcing processes haven't been included in ice sheet models yet. And so, to address this problem, we developed a coupled ice sheet subglacial hydrology model that um, resolves two freshwater forcing processes of ice dynamics. And before I get to those, I just want to say that this is our model domain here, where we're showing bed topography from Bed Machine Antarctica. And you can really get a feel for how much of this basin is grounded below sea level, which is just going to be highlighted by that blue shading. And so the two freshwater forcing processes that we resolve are going to be um, the ability for subglacial water to reduce friction of the ice sheet sliding along the bed. Um, and so on the right-hand side there, we're just showing the um, steady state water column from our subglacial hydrology model. And this is just to show that there's subglacial water um, building up across the entire domain. And this acts, again, to reduce the frictional force of the ice sheet. Um, and that can lead to um, a sea level rise um, and so we're able to account for this by um, including the effective pressure from the subglacial hydrology model in a kalum like friction law in our ice sheet model. Um, we also account for enhanced grounding zone melt. And so fresh water can become channelized, and as we said, it can discharge into the sub-ice shelf ocean cavity. Um, and so what we're showing on the right there is the channelized subglacial flux field in that blue to purple shading and then the modeled ice shelf melt enhancements in the red shading. And so our parameterization accounts for, um, well, there's an increased melt of about 45 meters per year by Totten's southern grounding zone, which is just highlighted in that red there. And that accounts for about 50% of the melt signal there. Um, and so it's a really strong, but also a very localized effect. And so we're able to account for this with a new parameterization of ice shelf melting that's based um, on buoyant plume dynamics. And so hopefully, well, that should be published relatively soon, so hopefully it'll be coming across your computer screens. Um, and so with this coupled model, 
we run future simulations from 2017 out to 2100 using, and again, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned this before, this is using the ice sheet and sea level system model coupled to the glacier drainage system model. And so we run two uh, ocean forced scenarios, a low emission and a high emission, and you're seeing the time series of the ocean temperature input on the right there. And then for each ocean forcing scenario, we run four experiments that build in terms of the freshwater forcing processes that are resolved. Um, the first is just an ice only, so that has no subglacial hydrology anything in there. The second is um, an experiment resolving the decreased frictional drag. The third is an experiment resolving that ice shelf melt enhancement. And then the fourth is resolving both of those together. Um, and again, we run these out from 2017 out to 2100 to get a feel for if subglacial discharge in the subglacial environment will actually have an effect on the 2100 sea level contribution of the domain. And so this result here is showing the, um, how the subglacial freshwater system evolves um, in time. So starting in 2017 up in the top left corner and then moving out to 2100 in the bottom right corner. And I just wanted to show this to show that the subglacial system evolves um, quite extensively in many different ways. So in terms of the number of channels, you can see at the start, we just have a few channels draining into the heads of the major glaciers, but by the end, there's channels draining across almost, I mean, almost all grounding line points, essentially. Um, they also, the channels extend in length by um, many tens of kilometers and also in flux as well. And so this um, drives enhanced forcing on the ice sheet. And so in this video here, I'm gonna show how the grounding lines of the four different high emission experiments evolve in time. Um, and the color of the line corresponds to, the, to which experiment. Um, and so the ice only is in brown, and then the pink line is the experiment that includes all of the forcing processes. Um, and so, so I'm gonna start looking at the top of Totten Glacier here. Um, so by 2030, the simulations that resolve the melt enhancement unground. Um, and that's because that melt enhancement was really strong in that region there. And by about 2060, then, you'll notice that the other experiments that don't resolve that melt enhancement um, then start to unground, which you're starting to see now. Um, I think more impressively is retreat of Vanderford Glacier on the right. You can see huge discrepancies in the position of the grounding line, um, especially as we hit about 2085 or so. Um, the position of the grounding line with all of the feedbacks is, a, is retreated about 10 kilometers more than the other grounding lines. Um, and so this is just to show that these other forcing processes that we aren't resolving do drive accelerated retreat of the glaciers. And then in terms of the sea level rise contribution, so here we're showing the um, sea level time series for all eight experiments in units of millimeters of sea level rise equivalent on the left and then in units of gigatons on the right. Um, and so the low emission ocean forcing experiments are in the cold or the cool colors, and then the high emission are in the warm colors. Um, and so I think there's two main features that I just wanted to get out of this figure. The first is to say that um, ocean forcing is still the primary driver of uncertainty in um, the 2100 sea level contribution, right? You see the huge difference between the low emission and the high emission scenarios, but the um, impact of subglacial discharge is not negligible as well. For high emission scenarios, it increases the domain sea level contribution by about three millimeters, or that's about 38% relative to the ice only experiment. Um, and then in low emission scenarios, it's about a 2.5 millimeter increase. Um, and so these are processes that are not currently resolved, for instance, in the ISMIP simulations, um, or really uh, most ice sheet simulations. But here we're showing that it could really drive enhanced mass loss, um, especially from this domain in particular. And so in terms of the conclusions, um, as we said, subglacial discharge accelerated ice sheet retreat and ice sheet mass loss of the Aurora subglacial basin. Um, but I think the really interesting thing to get out of this is what does this mean for other vulnerable Antarctic basins? Um, so I'm showing some preliminary modeling results for Pine Island and Thwaites where We've just run the hydrology model to steady state and looked at what the melt rate enhancement would be. And they're extremely strong near the retreating grounding lines of Pine Island and Thwaites. Um, but because you know, the glacial configurations are different from what we see in the Aurora subglacial basin, we don't know 
if the same conclusions will hold, right? Will it be a 30% increase in mass loss, or will it not matter as much maybe because the ocean is so warm that it just outdoes everything? Um, and it's still to be determined, but um, I think that running these type of simulations across the Antarctic ice sheet is gonna be really important for trying to determine how the subglacial system could drive um, mass loss and projection time scales. So thank you so much. Okay, next up we have uh, Thomas Teisberg talking about uh, in glacial uh, speed from radar. All right, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Thomas Teisberg. I'm a grad student with Dusty Schroeder in the Stanford Radio Glaciology Lab. Um, if you've seen me talk before, I usually talk about drones and, and things like that, so this is a little bit of a departure from that, but bear with me. Um, I'd also like to thank my other collaborators, Paul Summers, who is here, and you can also bother him with questions, and uh, Matthew Morlingham, who's provided some really awesome insights on this, but unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, so unfortunately, you guys have only paid for the ad-supported version of this talk, so we're gonna start with a brief advertising interlude in response to a fantastic question that was asked on uh, Tuesday about whether there's going to be any open source, low cost radar systems coming to this community. The answer is yes. Uh, Anna Broom is another PhD student in uh, Dusty's lab with me. We're both actually electrical engineers. We just like to hang out with you guys because you guys are more fun. Uh, we have been working on these uh, software defined radio based uh, S, uh, radar systems. They are designed to be rapidly customized to your needs and they start at about $1,000. We each kind of have an example project that we work on. Mine is Peregrine, which is a fixed wing, uh, two meter wingspan UAV you can use for field surveying. Uh, Anna's is called Mapper, and it's a ground-based multi-frequency radar radiometer. Please come talk to us more. Uh, and now I will stop talking about uh, drones and end the advertising break. Um, so uh, it's really great to be presenting on the last day of this conference because I can leverage some really awesome presentations that have already been done. So we've had three or maybe four really amazing presentations already this conference on using uh, repeat pass radar sounding to measure the deformation of inglacial layers. Uh, so this saves me having to explain what the heck that is because uh, Johnny Kingslake and uh, Knut Christensen have already made amazing presentations about it. Uh, this is not a solved problem, of course. I think they would all agree with that. Um, but you have already seen that there are amazing teams of people working on it. So I think we can be confident that this will be solved as an observational problem. Uh, the other really awesome thing that I wanted to highlight um, is uh, Yunji and uh, Megana have both talked about data-driven methods of looking at uh, rheology and ice. Uh, and I also wanted to highlight Joanna Milstein's work who presented uh, last year at Waze talking about, about uh, methods of taking surface velocity data and, understand, and using that data to infer what the rheology of ice might be on floating ice shelves. And this is really, really promising as a way to get at this like long-standing question of wh what is the rheology of ice? What's going on with this? Why can't we, why can't we figure out like what the, what the law is here? Uh, but these techniques are mostly limited to floating ice right now because we need to be able to uh, impose enough assumptions to make just the surface velocity alone tell us something useful. So what I wanna look at today is whether there's a way we can extend some of these data-driven techniques to get at rheology upstream onto grounded ice using some of the inglacial deformation uh, observational techniques. So the basic idea here is, what if we take radar measurements and glacial layer deformation, we use those measurements to infer something about the three-dimensional velocity fields within the ice, so below the surface, getting velocity measurements, horizontal velocity measurements below the surface, and then use that to get some sort of observational constraints on ice rheology. I'm obviously not gonna talk about all of that in the next seven minutes, so I'm gonna focus on just this one piece, which is if we have these measurements of inglacial layer deformation, how do we get to uh, inglacial velocity profiles? So I think it's useful to step back and take a conceptual view of what we are actually measuring when we do this. So here's a wonderful uh, conceptual diagram of a glacier, and I have highlighted this one uh, layer in white, which is this beautiful, perfectly continuous layer, uh, which may not be very physically realistic, but Blame the illustrator. Uh, when we measure, when we do a repeat pass radar measurement here, what we get are these little vectors that represent the observed vertical motion of this layer between our baseline period, so over a course of a year or something like that. 
But if we zoom in on a little piece of this, and I've added this red line showing like maybe what this layer looks like a year later or whenever we come back in and revisit it. Uh, this vertical motion that we observe is actually a combination of two different things happening. One is the actual vertical motion of that little parcel of ice there moving you know, up or down in the, in the ice column. And then the other is, unless this layer is perfectly flat, that layer is also being advected in some unknown subsurface horizontal velocity field. And so the advection of this layer also causes some change in the observed elevation of the layer at this point. So mathematically, we can put this together and we can say that the, the actual vertical velocity of some little parcel of ice is a sum of the observed layer vertical motion, uh, what we actually saw with the radar, and then the effects of the layer horizontal advection, which depends on an unknown horizontal velocity field and the maybe known, maybe unknown uh, effects of the, the layer orientation. Uh, if we then take the derivative of that and plug that into mass conservation, we can get this uh, very ugly giant equation that I believe it's still before 9 a.m. and nobody wants to look at. So don't worry too much about this, but this is a three-dimensional partial differential equation, and this relates uh, the velocity field and Uh, in glacial velocity field. Unfortunately, that data definitely doesn't exist now, and I'm not particularly optimistic that it's going to exist in the near future, although if you have a way, please let me know. Uh, so we wanted to look for a way that we could simplify this a little bit more and test what you could do with this with a little less data. So for that, I need to add one new assumption. Uh, I think this is a fairly safe assumption, but basically we are adding the constraint that the velocity, the map plane ver version of the velocity field at depth has the same direction as the surface velocity. So all we're saying is if you take some point on the ice and you take the velocity field going down from the surface all the way down, the direction is always the same. Magnitude varies, but like the direction is always the same in, in map plane. Feel free to come talk to me later if you have strong objections to this. Using this, if we then take a radar profile that goes along the contour of a surface velocity flow line, then we can actually reduce that partial differential equation to a single ordinary differential equation that we can solve along each layer line on the projection of the surface velocity contour onto each layer. So now we have a, an ODE that we can solve along every layer that we trace in our interferometric radar measurements, and we can get horizontal velocities along those. This is an ODE, so it requires a boundary condition, and that means on one end or the other, you need to know what the horizontal velocity was where you started tracing that layer. In practice, the easiest way to do this is for your line to start from an ice divide. There are other possibilities, but that's the, probably the easiest option. All right, way too much math before 9 a.m. Let's talk about some, some results. So uh, we set up a very simple uh, shallow ice approximation model of this. Nothing I said before requires SIA, but just to, to simply demonstrate this, that was a good place to start. So I have two scenarios here. On your left is a, a, a flow exponent 2.5. On the right, n equals 3. These are set up by construction to have identical surface topography and identical surface horizontal velocity. So from a like satellite observation perspective, these look identical. If we then go and we simulate some layers and then we solve for the horizontal velocities using that ODE along the layers, uh, we get results that look like this. So the dashed black lines are the, the true from the, from the SAA model, and then the blue dots are the result of solving the ODE along, uh, along the line and then sampling it at some X position along the glacier. And you can see that while these have the same um, horizontal velocity at the surface, they have very different profiles of, of velocity as you go down uh, into the depth of the, of the ice. So this is what we want to, want to see. Obviously, this is a, a, a simplified version with a very simple model, uh, but it's sort of the, the, the first step here. There's many things you could imagine trying to do with a, a inglacial velocity profile, but the one that I promised we would talk about before was looking at ice rheology. So if we take all of the uh, results that we got along the entire uh, uh, length of this simulated glacier and we plot them on a stress uh, strain curve shown here in log log scale, you can see that the scatter points for the two align very nicely with the, the sort of theoretically expected stress strain relationship for the three, uh, or I, I only showed two of the three, but for the two uh, different uh, flow law exponents that we, that we simulated here. 
Um, so yeah, so what I want you to take away from this, uh, interferometric repeat pass radar can probably be used to infer uh, three-dimensional and glacial velocity fields, but there are some caveats to that. The most important being that the survey design is extremely important. You're probably not going to be able to take arbitrary repeat radar lines and, and do this. You're either going to need a huge densely gridded survey or you're going to need those to be uh, repeat passes along a uh, surface velocity flow line. But this provides an observable that could directly uh, feed data-driven methods for coming up with uh, rheology that we've already seen presented here and at other conferences. And uh, last, the takeaway I always want you to take a cake from this is that we're going to need a lot of data for this, and so having some UAVs that can collect ice penetrating radar data might be a, might be a handy thing. Um, I'll be around the whole rest of the day, including the, the uh, workshop, so please come find me if you have questions, and if you can't find me for some reason, my email's up here. Thank you. Up next, we have Bernie Fear talking about um, drainage of subglacial link Engelhart. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Bryony Freer. I am going into the final year of my PhD at the British Antarctic Survey. Um, I work with Oliver Marsh, Anna Hogg, and Helen Fricker, um, and I've just been at Scripps for the last two months, so it's um, nice to kind of meet the uh, American community whilst I've been over here. Uh, thanks to the organizers for putting on this meeting, and especially to NSF, NASA, and the Transantarctic Association for helping with financial support to get me to this meeting. Um, before I start with my actual talk from today, I just want to flash up that the first paper from my PhD was actually published this week <laughs> in the prize fair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we were looking um, at using ISAT2 laser altimetry to um, observe different modes of Antarctic tidal grounding line migration. So if anyone's interested in talking about that during the meeting, uh, or the rest of today, I guess, um, then please do come and talk to me. But now I'm going to be speaking about the second part of work that I've been doing more recently, um, looking at the recent onset of drainage of subglacial Lake Engelhart on the Seipel Coast. Um, and the impact on the grounding line um, retreat downstream. So subglacial Lake Engelhart, as I said, it's on the Seipel Coast. It's located um, under Willens, and it's one of several active um, subglacial lakes that was first discovered um, in the early 2000s by Helen and others um, with original ISAT laser altimetry. We saw these figures yesterday in Sophia's presentation. Um, so they found that this lake drained between 2003 and 2006, um, releasing about two cubic kilometers of fresh water into the um, Ross Ice Shelf cavity. And this lake is particularly interesting because it's located really close to the grounding line. Um, so, and this grounding line has, we've observed it retreating kind of since the, um, at least the early 2000s. And this grounding line retreat and ice thinning there um, had been suggested as possible triggers for the 2003 um, onset of drainage but we didn't really have quite enough data at the time to fully kind of understand um, the linkages between these two processes. But now with the more advances in um, satellite technology, um, we might have more of a chance of kind of unpicking these interactions. So we now actually have a 20 year record of drainage at this lake. Um, so this graph just shows the time series of surface elevations um, taken at these three crossover points on the map from ISAT. So we can see that drainage that was first seen um, between 2003 and 2006, and then we see it start to slowly refill again. We can then continue this record with Cryosat 2 altimetry, um, which just showed that the lake was continuing to, um, to refill. And then more recently with ISAT 2, it continued to refill, and then we see this sudden kind of onset of drainage again in about July, August 2021, which is really exciting. It's only the second drainage we've seen in the observational period um, of this lake. And the resolution of ISAT2 is, is much higher, so we can, we can make out lake boundaries a lot better. So this is an animation showing um, surface elevation change over, over this region um, from April 2019 to 
July 2023 this year. And we see this six metre fall in surface elevations over this period over the main lake. But it also has given us um, enough data to see that there's this upstream kind of feeder lake which fills and drains just before the onset of the main lake drainage, which is pretty interesting. And this drainage is still going on. Um, it's drained about 1.2 cubic kilometers of water so far. Um, and we expect it to kind of continue draining until about the end of 2023 if it does the same kind of pattern as with ISAP. So that's cool, we've seen that the lake is draining again. Um, I am then have been looking at the impact of, um, the potential impact of this lake drainage on the downstream grounding line. And I'm gonna show some results, um, preliminary results so far in three main areas, um, which I've just to note is the east embayment, and this is where the um, subglacial water is modeled to, to kind of outflow. Uh, the west embayment, and then this kind of strange grounded feature in the middle, which we'll come back to you later. So first, in the east embayment, um, we have a interferogram from RadarSat2 from 2009 that shows us the grounding line position at this inland um, limit of the dense uh, fringes. And there's not much data. Um, we don't have Sentinel-1 coverage or anything, so we managed to actually um, task Terrasar x to get um, some, some data this year. So we have an interferogram from, from July 2023, which shows there's been about a two to three kilometer retreat in the grounding line um, downstream of the lake. And now the grounding line is only uh, seven kilometers downstream from the lake. Um, and this is a non-trivial distance of retreat in this, in this part of Antarctica. And we can expect that if this retreat continues, at some point it will join up with the lake, which will be a really interesting kind of thing to watch out for in the future. And as I was looking at the grounding line in this east embayment, I almost missed seeing what was going on further to the west. And we actually, if we zoom in, we see this other dense set of fringes right on the edge of the interferogram that we have, much further upstream than the grounding line of the west embayment. Unfortunately, that's the only data I have from, from Terrasar X. So I can't map out the, map out the whole um, change using interferograms. But I then turned to ISAT2 to see if I could see this, any signal here in the ISAT2 data. So I've taken this one track, which shows the surface elevation um, along this track. At, taken at a low tide and then taken um, another track that was taken that was measured during a high tide and we can see from the elevations at the bottom where the um, where the high tide track the, in blue deviates from the um, from zero it shows that there's a tidal flexure happening there so there's actually water getting in at higher tides and so the grounding lines are marked by those blue dots and are separated by about nine kilometers and the elevation anomaly is just under a meter so there's at least that much water getting in at higher tides. And if we do this with all the ISAT2 data we have there, we can actually essentially map out that there's been about a 13 kilometer retreat of the grounding line into a, a six kilometer um, wide kind of embayment here. And it seems to, um, the channel seems to get wider and deeper at um, higher tides. So there's some kind of tidal modulation going on there, which is an interesting signal. So we're interested in what's causing this retreat, and we have a few kind of hypotheses. Firstly, if we look at the long-term um, elevation change in this area, it, this channel maps up well to a, a region that's been thinning um, by just under a meter over the last three or four years. And because this region is so lightly grounded, just small changes in ice thickness could kind of cause big grounding line retreats um, or causing the ice to unground. So this is probably a likely influence um, in the signal that we're seeing. And this area of thinning is actually connected, if we, if we zoom out to this larger like arc of thinning that goes around to the other side of the Crary Ice Rise. Um, and it stands in contrast to what we're seeing at the rest of Willens, which is clearly thickening over time. So if anyone actually has any suggestions of what this could be, I'd love to talk about it um, some more. These are very early results. Um, so second was looking at the interaction between the drainage itself and whether the drainage could have caused this grounding line retreat. Um, 
And I don't think that this is actually a direct cause because in the ISAT 2 data, we see that this channel started to unground before the onset of lake drainage. So there was some retreat happening before the drainage started. But I don't know, but maybe there could be a possible switch in the flow pathway and that could be indicating that water is now draining from the lake through this kind of west embayment. So that's something to kind of explore a bit more. And the reverse way, did the grounding line retreat trigger the onset of the drainage? Possibly. Again, I need to do some more work into working out what's going on. But um, the onset of lake drainage did occur just after a very high set of spring tides, where the we see the channel um, getting much larger and wider. And potentially, that could have um, contributed to the, the lake seal um, being overcome somehow. But um, again, open to suggestions from anyone here who um, knows more about this. And finally, um, this um, central grounded feature that we see in the interferograms, this long and thin um, feature, I don't know exactly what it is. We see when we compare it to the 2023 Terrasat X interferogram that um, this feature has actually migrated and got longer over time. And it's only suggests to me that there's something. and grounding line retreat, which is something we know remarkably little about. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks. And um, finally, this morning, we have Jessica Galliardi. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jessica Galliardi. I'm a third year PhD student at UC Santa Cruz. And I'm super excited um, to talk to you guys today about my research, how I'm using subglacial precipitates to constrain the timing and the forcing of ice lowering in a Ross Sea outlet glacier during the most recent glacial termination. This is a really cool session to be a part of. There's so much cool stuff that everyone just presented on. So I'm excited. Um, so glacial terminations, what we know and what we don't know. I'm showing here some of the classical um, paleoclimate archives that we use when we're thinking about glacial cycles, um, these cycles between warm inter interglacials and long cold glacial periods. And typically we call upon um, the concentration of atmospheric CO2, um, atmospheric temperatures, which is shown in delta deuterium in the middle plot, um, and sea level, which is shown by the proxy of delta O18 in marine sediment cores. And all of these are showing these warm interglacials, long cold glacials, this cycle between um, these two different climate conditions. And we've inferred based on these records that this must uh, come from ice sheets growing and shrinking, especially the sea level component, like that has to be the result of the cryosphere growing and shrinking. Um, but all these proxies, are we, we've used them to make inferences about what the ice sheet is doing, but they're all a little bit far removed from the specifics of what the ice sheet is doing. So it's sort of like the what, but not the how. Um, and so what I'm interested in getting into with these subglacial precipitates is a little bit more of a direct archive of how the ice on a more um, granular level is um, growing and shrinking. And so to do that, I'm gonna zoom in on this area called Magnus Valley. Um, Magnus Valley is um, part of a system of outlet glaciers that are draining from the Eastern Arctic ice, they're draining ice from the Eastern Arctic ice sheet into the Ross Sea, um, shown with the star right there. Um, and Magnus Valley is interesting for a number of reasons. One of the main reasons that it's interesting to us is that it's one of the very few places in Antarctica where um, bedrock is actually exposed at the surface. The vast majority of Antarctica obviously is covered in ice. Um, so to a rock person like me, an area like this is exciting because it's one of the few places where we can access the wealth of information that's contained in the rock record. 
Um, and another thing that's interesting about Magnus Valley is that we already have some existing cosmogenic exposure data from this area. And so what I'm showing here in the top panel um, is the Antarctic temperature stack, which is just a compiled um, ice core temperature record that's showing sort of the evolution of temperature in Antarctica over the last deglaciation with um, initial warming during Heinrich Studio 1 and then this sort of pause and reversal um, during the Antarctic cold reversal or the ACR and then, a re and then resuming that warming um, into the Holocene. And so what I'm showing in the panel below is the um, existing cosmogenic exposure data from this area where Magnus Valley is. This cosmogenic exposure data um, is from Hatherton Glacier, which is what Magnus Valley is draining into. And um, what I'm showing in these sort of color bars and in this red circle here is the existing interpretation of this data in work by King et al. from 2020. Um, and they've sort of focused on the later part of the record in making their interpretation and they've inferred um, a local LGM at around 10,000 years ago. So the, the global LGM was around 20, 22,000 years ago, but they've inferred that the local ice maximum occurred at 10,000 years ago, and then that was followed by ice lowering um, throughout the Holocene. Um, and as part of that interpretation, there's this sort of, um, this higher um, elevation exposure data over here um, that has in this interpretation is sort of considered to be an outlier. It's not considered um, to be significant. And spoiler alert, <laughs> with my data, I'm going to uh, see if that's actually the case. And, uh, and I, I'm, not, I'm not so sure that it actually is an outlier. Um, but yeah, this is basically showing through time the elevations at which ice was uncovered. And so there's this interpretation of local LGM and then ice lowering into the Holocene. So I mentioned that I'm gonna use subglacial precipitates to investigate this ice history. And so just to review, my amazing colleague Sophia and Slavic did a great job of covering this earlier, so I'm gonna kind of breeze through this. Um, but just what you need to know is that in these precipitates that we have, um, in previous work that's been done by my lab, we've shown that calcite, which is the orange layers in this precipitate shown here, um, equals flushing, which indicates acceleration of ice, which indicates thinning of ice. And the opal, which is the white layers, um, as indicative of freezing, which we link to deceleration and ice thickening. And so to bring you into the precipitates in this study, um, I've used uranium series geochronology to date subglacial precipitates from Magnus Valley. And so I'm showing some field photos of some of the precipitates in this study. And what you mainly need to know is that um, different from the precipitate that I showed on the previous slide, these precipitates are um, calcite. So it's a, these sort of speckles here are a layer of calcite deposited directly on top of this boulder, and then right on top of the calcite, the white stuff that you're seeing is a thin layer of opal. And so we have one layer of calcite and one layer of opal. Um, and so I dated the calcite using uranium series dating, and I found that it clocked in at right around 16,000 years. It was a very reproducible age, so that was really cool. Um, and it clocked in right at 16,000 years, right in the middle of um, that sort of warming trend that I pointed out during Heinrich Stadia 1, this warming arm right here. Um, which, and so as I mentioned, calcite is um, correlated to uh, ice acceleration and thinning. And so interestingly, I'm seeing a signal of ice thinning much earlier than what had been interpreted previously of the ice thinning occurring here. So the signal of ice thinning that I'm seeing is happening a lot earlier. Um, and so then getting to the opals, um, the opals were not able to be dated. Um, I'm, still, I'm still hoping that maybe I'll be able to get a date out of them. But so far, um, for reasons that I don't have time to get into, uh, they were not able to be dated, but um, I was still able to collect data on them and make some interpretations of them. And so the, the most important observation about these opals is that they are stratigraphically above the calcite. So you can see in these SEM images on the right, the pink is the calcite and the blue is the opal. So the opal being stratigraphically on top of the calcite means that it has to be the same age or younger. The other observation that we made about these opals is that there is no erosional surface on top of the calcite in between the opals, meaning that the opal has to have been deposited before another flushing event could come through and create an erosional surface on top of the calcite, like what we saw in Sophia's samples yesterday. The other thing about opal is that opal, um, because of the way that it forms, it accumulates very slowly, meaning that it's very unlikely that it formed instantaneously right after the calcite formed. It's likely that there was a lag time of at least a thousand years um, before the opal was deposited. 
on top of the calcite. And so taking all of these things together, I feel comfortable reasonably concluding that the opal likely formed during the Antarctic cold reversal, that sort of interruption of the termination um, right after Heinrich Stadial 1. And I'm going to make more measurements on these opals to try to further constrain this interpretation, so I'm going to get some serum anomaly data um, that'll constrain redox conditions and some clumped isotopes that will constrain formation temperature. Um, okay, this figure is messed up, but the, the, the title says um, cosmogenics recontextualized with new precipitate data. And so what I'm showing here is um, in light of everything that I've just outlined, I sort of have a new interpretation of what I think that the local ice history was in this catchment based on the ages that I successfully dated from the Magnus Valley calcites and then also my interpretation of the um, opal deposition. And so what I think is likely going on is that these data points to the right of the cosmogenic plot are actually not outliers and I think that this downslope here is indicating ice lowering in this area during Heinrich Stadial 1 and I think that the presence of the opals after the Magnus Valley calcites is likely indicative of ice recovery in this area during the Antarctic cold reversal followed then by ice lowering during the Holocene. And so that's sort of um, taken, taking these uh, cosmogenic dates in the context of these new uh, uranium series calcite dates and everything that we know about what calcite and opal indicate, this is my sort of uh, reinterpretation of what I think might have been going on here. And so this has some interesting implications. Um, Many ice sheet models are forced by accumulation only. Our result uh, supports the high sensitivity of ice sheet margins to ocean forcing, and so um, future models could, I, I hope that this sort of pushes, pushes in the direction of let's incorporate more um, ocean forcing and more ocean sensitivity into our ice sheet models. And then additionally, just this constraint on um, the local ice lowering history in this one specific location could hopefully um, provide a helpful constraint on some ice models. And so just to go over what my main takeaways are, the calcite precipitates from Magnus Valley show evidence of ice lowering at 16,000 years during Heinrich Stadial 1. They're capped by opals that indicate possible, probable ice thickening during the Antarctic cold reversal. This constitutes a different local ice history than previous interpretations um, based on the cosmogenic exposure data. Um, but, I, but I think that this interpretation is still totally consistent um, with the cosmogenic exposure data. And um, this result supporting high ice sheet sensitivity to ocean forcing could have implications, hopefully, for our future ice sheet models. So with that, uh, thank you. And back. All right, thanks so much to all of the speakers for a really great session. If we could have all of our speakers come back and um, take a seat, we'll get the discussion started. Um, we'll have the other two co-conveners running around with microphones, so feel free to just raise your hand. All right, questions for the speakers. <laughs> All right, here we go. I can hear myself. Um, let's talk about surface melt. So I see some fascinating results regarding subglacial hydrology and projections into the future. And we know the Seipel Coast is pretty warm in, in the summer. I mean, I've seen surface melt there myself. And we know East Antarctica, I mean, we see surface melt all over the place in the summer there. So uh, how far are we off from, from those parts of Antarctica, at least starting to look more somewhat like what Greenland looks like in the summer, where you have surface to bed connections, enhanced subglacial outflow, and crazy melting? Um, yeah, I can talk on the projection side of things. So um, that's something that we didn't take into account in our projections, um, which I forgot to mention, but it probably means that what we're presenting could possibly be a lower bound on how subglacial hydrology could impact future ice dynamics. Um, and it's definitely a direction that we're looking to head. But um, yeah, I, 
I'm not too sure on the observational side, though, if anyone else wants to chime in there. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to have a great answer for you, but um, I haven't looked at this, the supraglacial lakes at all there. I mean, I don't, I don't actually know how much. Maybe um, Philip is a good person to talk to about it. Philip has some answers um, later, yeah, so. Um, but I guess we're seeing it more in like the Antarctic Peninsula as well, and the Antarctic Peninsula glaciers are starting to look a bit more like Greenland glaciers. So I imagine it's just a, as it warms up, it will be a slow transition to those kind of things happening. And there's lots of, um, there's lots of subglacial lakes in on Willens and in generally in the Sipal Coast, so those connections may be um, easier to establish there than elsewhere. But I don't know about the timings of these things. Hi, um, I have a question for Jessica. I was wondering whether you found any of the um, calcite precipitates during the Younger Dryers. Like, I think that'd be really cool if you could show it both for Heinrich Kwan and, and the Younger Dryers. Yeah, I wish that we had. Unfortunately, we're limited by what people have given to us. No one's ever actually gone looking for these samples. Everything that we've dated has been something that um, people that we know from the field has brought to us. And so we're definitely, um, from the younger dryas, so. Yeah. <laughs> so I, uh, hi, so I have a particular question to Thomas. So a very nice talk, so I'm thinking it's very, also very connected to my own work. Several question I want to ask about uh, your methodology as well as your way to understand the rheology. So the first question is that uh, when you do the radar line measurement, so you usually just do it like, for example, a straight line, or you Will you think about the, was, would that be easy, for example, just trying to do the radar line to following the streamline of the surface? Because as a, as a modeler, sometimes if you have the velocity along the streamline, then it's actually have a lot of simplicity when you do a lot of modeling. So this is one question. And then the second question is that I think when you do the inversion, oh sorry, when you do the mathematics, so you basically, you, you, so, we, so the first equation you're showing is the kinematic boundary condition, which you get the relation of the L with UV, as you described in a very good way. And the second actually is the mass conservation, or the continuity equation. But I just wonder if because for the ice sheet, whether you will consider the density will have variation in the Z direction, and whether is there any ability to measure density profile so that it can make your horizontal velocity be a little bit better. And the third, if we have time, <laughs> so it's when you do the inversion, I think it's very nice, so you can get N. But I'm just curious because I think in temperature variation is also something very important in, in ice sheet. So if you're thinking, you know the plane free profile, and then when you're doing the inversion, whether you also can also get in, for example, even the power law relation more well, and, and, and even again, you can get the time, time dependence of the coefficient of your power law relation. Oh uh, yeah, this is just, uh, in my general <laughs> question, but you can uh, happy to answer anything or we can discuss later. Thank you. Yeah, those are, those are three great questions and uh, l all right, let me see if I can get through them and I may have to clarify it with you. But okay, so the first question was about the, the, the flow lines that we're talking about and um, I guess, y yes, to clarify, we're talking about like, like a track that follows like the contour of the, of the surface velocity. Um, what was your question about that specifically? Like, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Streamline flow line. Yes. That's yes. That's what we, that's what we mean. Um, okay. Your second question is. is um, wait, what was your second question? Yeah. Density profile. Right. Okay. That's a great question. Yeah. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. I didn't have time to talk about that in my in my talk. So there is this issue that um, the interpretation of layer motion in the fern is a little bit unclear because you don't know how the fern is densifying. Um, and depending on what you're trying to study, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. So I know, I forget who, somebody mentioned in their talk looking at, uh, looking at a repeat radar to measure for intensification, which is an, an interesting area. Um, for our work, we've basically been assuming that we will just ignore the fern. Our assumption is that the fern is close enough to the surface 
Wait, 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 Matt. <laughs> hold up, hold up. Hold up. <laughs> hold up, Brooke. <laughs> so so, so, so we, we assume from the purpose of horizontal velocity that the fern is close enough to the surface that it's moving at about the same speed as the surface, and so we can reasonably interpret, interpolate between like from below to, to the surface. And now you're absolutely right that it, depending on how you do this, the fern could complicate your interpretation even of lower velocities, because if you try to peg off the surface to get absolute deformations, that doesn't work because you don't know how the fern changed from one year to the next. So that introduces an unknown constant sh shift in what your positions of all the layers are. The good news is our PDE actually doesn't require the absolute layer shifts. It requires the spatial derivative of the layer shifts in the Z direction. So we can basically throw out the unknown values from the fern part and then just take spatial derivatives below the fern and a constant shift introduced by changes in the fern from one year to the next, I think then drops out. Um, I'd love to talk to you more about this. <laughs> Absolutely, and I'm all, all in favor of getting more radars out there to tell us more things, by all means. You're going to have to remind me which the third question was. <laughs> so the third is like the temperature variation. So when you, if we know, mm -hmm. we agree that there will be temperature variation. So for your method, is that able also able to, can try to able to, because power law is the one part, but also yeah. the power, the coefficient power law is usually temperature dependent. So is any, the method you provided have ability also knowing that coefficient and its variation with temperature, assuming we know the temperature profile. Yeah, no, also a great question, right? So, so we often think of, of the rheology as just being like a stress-strain relationship that's dependent on exponent, but there are other things, as, uh, as Megan has also pointed out very nicely in, in her talk, like there are, there are more parameters at play here. Um, uh, so a, a quick little shout out to, to Anna Broom who, uh, and uh, Nicole Beinert, who are a current and former student in our lab who work on radar-based um, approaches to measuring temperature in, in ice. So there are some things coming along the line that could help us get directly at temperature. Beyond that, the only thing I'll say is this gives us a way to eliminate one more variable if we can measure the inglacial o velocities. And then I think work like yours uh, gives us the, f the foundation to say, like, if we can eliminate one more variable, now maybe we can start to integrate temperature models and try to understand how, how those pieces play in. But yeah, we're not, it doesn't solve the whole thing. I'm gonna channel my inner Sridhar here because I think he left. Um, taking this to the big picture, actually all four of you nicely presented Questions that need more radar. Uh, you know, how do, what are the processes causing, you know, calcite formation in the subglacial environment? How water grounding line interactions, you know, necessitates more radar surveying. And then Thomas is always pitching more radar. <laughs> but they all require different radar survey designs, right, to answer these questions. And then, you know, you can all argue with just the mass balance people who want flux gates all the time. Um, and we've kind of reached a point, particularly if we start getting more drones in the air, we've reached a point where we can think about all these kind of exotic survey designs, but we can't do them all, right? So how do we prioritize this? Whose question is the most important? <laughs> I will not answer the question of whose question is more important, but I will say, and then I'll pass it down and everyone else can fight for their question being the most important, that. Um, in, in my view, what we need is a, is a paradigm shift of how we think about collecting airborne geophysics. Uh, on the satellite side, we either get, we either have satellites that have, you know, sort of near universal coverage or we have sort of tasking and, and, and prioritized allocations that can go through and then get data relatively quickly. Uh, we should be moving to a point where we have permanently deployed UAVs that live in Antarctica and are basically on an on a ongoing basis permanently tasked with a list of, of, of questions. And so it shouldn't be this thing of like, okay, only one person gets their measurements this year. Uh, there should be, it should be like satellite tasking where we are continuously operating these, these, these vehicles and collecting data down a list. Yes, well, I definitely second that. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, on the modeling side, I think validation of subglacial hydrology models is just, it's a huge issue right now. Um, and they're very hard to validate and so, um, something I've been very interested in is, is in some type of way to be able to infer where these channels are underneath the grounded ice. Um, another thing I'm interested in is possibly um, 
adding AP reses into grounding zones so we can try to infer ice shelf melt where satellite estimates are not really very viable to use. Um, and in that way, we can really get a feel for what the, um, how the ocean, the subglacial environments are meeting to drive melt of ice shelves. And then we can use that to validate melt parameterizations. We can also validate grounding line positions. And so I think moving forward, that'd be something I'd be really interested to see. Yeah, I definitely agree with all of that. Um, I think we've seen so many presentations this this week that have talked about the that that we don't know enough about what's going on at the grounding zones, and you know, big picture wise, even knowing where the grounding lines are and a lot of our um, especially fast flowing ice, which it's hard to get that information from satellite data, um, and really sa uh, like southerly grounding lines as well, like the Sipal Coast zone that's outside of the. Um, extent of a lot of like Sentinel-1 and a lot of our regular missions. So hopefully with NISA, I think, I'm not exactly sure how far south that's going, but that's an exciting um, kind of advance. And I guess with satellite technology, once it's up and we're getting coverage, you know, regularly, I think that's a really important thing to prioritize so we can get continent-wide and, and measurements and that feeds into the people that need it for, you know, large scale ice sheet um, mass balance estimates and modeling, um, yeah. And the influence of tides, just to shout out, <laughs> shout out um, the tidal stuff, I think um, is overlooked and not included in a lot of models. And I think we need to, we need to kind of start to um, appreciate the impact it has on basal melt, on, um, on just how we understand what's happening in the long term as well. Um, and from satellites and, and, I, and from ground-based radar would be good. But to get the whole coverage, I think, you know, I'm a pro-satellite person. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, the bulk of my measurement, my measurements in general don't really rely on satellite data, but uh, but I do think that I'm always very interested in um, like subglacial lake drainage and what the time scales of that are because I think that our work is sort of looking farther back into the past on these longer time scale um, lake drainage processes. But I think that it's always very useful wherever we can to try to link what we know from the paleo record and what we can actually directly observe because oftentimes um, there's a little bit of a mismatch between what our paleo record is showing us and what we can directly observe in the modern. And so um, I'm always interested in um, the satellite data of uh, what the subglacial lakes are doing because I think that that can always um, shed more light on our interpretations of the paleo record. But I mean, it's all, it's all important, yeah. it's all good. <laughs> Thank you. And I think on that great note, I think we'll wrap it up. Let's give a big hand for our awesome speakers.